So to begin with, I would love to know about your specialization, the focus of your expertise, and the modalities that you work with. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for having me on today. So I'm Janet. I am a licensed therapist in Los Angeles, California. I specialize in trauma work. So I work with a lot of clients working through a lot of their trauma histories, their trauma memories, any distressing life experiences. And I utilize different types of trauma modalities to help assist them like EMDR, brain spotting, internal family systems, mindfulness, things like that. And it's really powerful. I really love the work that we do together. So what is brain spotting? So brain spotting is a type of therapy that um, utilizes sort of um, a method where you look at what's called a brain spot when you're processing trauma. And the idea behind it is it helps us go into the subcortical part of the brain. If we're just talking about a trauma memory, we stay in the prefrontal cortex of the brain, but brain spotting helps us go to a deeper place into our neuroexperiential or subcortical part of our brain. And it helps us see what is deeper that we're carrying that maybe we're not consciously aware of to hopefully work through and resolve and to come to a place of neutrality with it. So what does that mean? Do you, are you using brain scans or are you using talk therapy? What does that actually look like? No brain scans, although if clients want to go get that, I, I don't stop them. Um, I actually have my pointer here, so I'm going to show you. Do you see my pointer in front right. of me? Yeah, yes, yes. So let's say you're talking to me, you're my client, and you're talking to me about a distressing issue or a life event that occurred that you know, is causing you to feel a lot of anxiety. Maybe you're having PTSD symptoms. Um, This is the pointer that I use. And I actually, we kind of pull it up. If you're my client on my screen here, I ask you to look at the pointer and just kind of notice different spots on the screen. And I ask you to notice which of the spots do you feel more activated when you think about the memory? Which of the spots do you feel a little bit more calm or neutral? And then once you find the particular spots on the screen that feels activating or neutral, we focus on that to see what comes forward in your memories, what comes forward in your body, what do you feel emotionally, what are some thoughts that are coming up for you to go deeper and deeper in those layers. And then from there to see if we can come to a place of resolution with it. So the idea behind brain spotting is where you look impacts how you feel. So you tell me the memory, um, we find different areas of the screen or maybe off screen for you to look to process the particular trauma that you're wanting to work on. So looking at the spots will trigger a memory? It might. It might trigger um, something else. It might trigger other thoughts. It might trigger other memories that are associated with the original memory. It might trigger feelings. It might trigger um, something that you might notice in your body happen. It could trigger many different things. So looking at the spots actually impacts your brain? Yes. So looking at the brain spots impact um, the processing that happens neuroexperientially in your brain. Absolutely. Okay. Does Is there anything that happens before the technique is actually executed? How do you set it up? How do you get your uh, client in a place to do this work, kind of work? Well, the main thing is I want my clients, no matter what type of therapy I work with, with the client, I want to make sure the client is comfortable with me. So if I'm just meeting with someone, I'm probably not going to pull forward any of these techniques because I want to make sure that the individual feels comfortable wants to feel emotionally safe with me, um, wants to feel like they're ready for this type of therapy. So we utilize the amount of time that they need, maybe several sessions or several months of sessions um, to gauge the comfort level and to gauge the client's readiness to do this type of therapy. Okay. And what is the premise um, supporting this, uh, you know, what is the premise behind this work, like brain spotting? What is the goal? What is the intention? What is it that you're trying to get at through this work? Every client has a different goal. Some clients will say, I just want to feel better. 
Some clients will say, I want to feel neutral about the memory. I don't want this memory to take a hold of me. Some clients will say, I just want to sleep better. I want to feel less anxious at night. So every client has a different goal. I would say the main probably common theme that a lot of my clients will talk about is they just don't want these memories to impact them anymore. They don't want to feel um, still activated by these memories when they think about it. So I would say the main goal really is to see if we can come to a place of neutrality, seeing these memories for what they truly are. It's not the client's fault for what happened. And the other goal I would say is to emotionally feel better, to hopefully physically feel better because so much of trauma is felt in the body as well. And to also not feel like this memory is taking a hold on the person in the same way that it used to. Okay, so it is very trauma focused, a trauma that is attached to specific memories. Yeah, not every memory, I would say the client deems to be traumatic. Some memories may be just distressing, some memories are maybe uncomfortable. Um, traumatic memories depends on several factors. A, what's the diagnosis? Does the client experience symptoms of PTSD or acute stress disorder? Is it impacting the quality of life, the quality of functioning the client has? Um, so I think it depends on, on some of those factors, but I would say the work that I do, yes, is very trauma focused. We focus on a lot of distressing life memories or trauma focused memories. And is this uh, a practice that you can, you choose for yourself or is it, you know, is this something that your therapist recommends depending on your case? It can be both. Some clients will come in and call and say, I want to try brain spotting. I've heard about it. I'm really interested in it. Can we try it? And some clients maybe have no idea about this type of therapy. And I might suggest it. I might recommend it and say, you know what? I think we might want to try this to see if it might help us move through the process of how you feel right now. Now, before we go deeper into the trauma work itself, let me ask you about a couple of other modalities that I read about on your website. There is one uh, that is the, I don't know how to pronounce it, the havening technique. The havening technique. Havening. Okay, so yes. what is this about? So the havening technique is a model that is a psychosensory model. The idea behind the havening techniques is we use a specific type of touch called the havening touch. Um, on screen, I'm happy to show you here. So the idea is when you're working through a challenging memory, a traumatic experience, something distressing, um, we implement this type of touch called the havening touch to basically soothe the body and soothe the nervous system. Um, and the idea behind it is as you're doing this, it helps bring down the activation level. It helps bring more calm soothing feelings to the nervous system. And it helps actually the client with feeling a lot more at ease, a lot more comfortable and supported when they are working through the specific memory. So it's psychosensory, meaning that there's a specific type of touch involved that can be implemented while they're working through and processing the memory. Okay, so for my for the listeners who are for the listeners and not those who are watching this on YouTube, that you're basically stroking your forehead underneath your eyes and you are stroking your arms. So this is something you do for the client or the client does for themselves? The practice that I'm personally comfortable with is I teach clients how to do this themselves. Um, some clients are comfortable with touch by another person and other clients are not. So I absolutely want to respect that. There are some therapists that do implement this type of touch to their clients. So I think it just depends on the therapist that you work with, but both are very powerful. Even if the client is just implementing this type of touch for themselves, it can be really, really supportive. And the idea is with this touch is you're producing Delta waves in the body to bring forth more soothing feelings as you're talking through and thinking about the challenging experience. So getting them from a very highly activated place to something more calm and relaxed. 
Okay, that makes, that makes so much sense. Another one that I wanted to ask you about was the attachment-focused EMDR. What, what is this about? So attachment-focused EMDR, EMDR stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. And the idea behind attachment-focused EMDR is same thing. We're working with clients with trauma histories, trauma memories that they want to work on. We use something called bilateral stimulation to um, bring clients to their deeper, uh, deep conscious state within themselves so that um, when they're processing the memory, they utilize something called exposure work, a little bit of exposure work and desensitization with these memories so that the client can also come to a place of resolution and neutrality um, at the end of these sessions so that the memories don't keep the client, I would say, activated. And so the client can also work through their beliefs and their thoughts associated with these memories. So when we talk about bilateral stimulation, that can happen several ways. The classic kind of the way that it was developed was with eye movements. So let's say client is talking about or thinking about the memory. The therapist moves their hand or moves a wand back and forth. The client's eyes follow the back and forth movement. Other ways to stimulate the bilateral stimulation is clients can think about the memory with eyes closed and tap back and forth. And that's another way to cultivate bilateral stimulation. So the idea behind that is we're basically mimicking a process that happens to us in our sleep. When we're in like a dream state, um, if you notice, the eyelids move back and forth when the client is in a dream state. And so the idea behind that is when we're in our deep dream state, sometimes we'll have dreams, sometimes we will have memories come forward, you know, in our sleep. And it's kind of our brain's way of cleaning things up in our subconscious. We are essentially kind of mimicking that when we do EMDR and when we bring up traumatic memories, because this helps us go to a deeper place in our brain to kind of help understand what are we still holding on to? What are the feelings in our body? What are the thoughts and beliefs that we're carrying associated with this memory so that we can essentially work through it and also come to a place of neutrality, resolution, and healing with it? So anybody who comes to you, I understand, is in need of help. Obviously, that's why, you know, even if you are you have a generally healthy life, uh, you go to a therapist because you think that you can do better. But where trauma is concerned, I know that no two people are the same and everybody, you know, has a different response and the intensity of it also varies. But does everybody, um, you know, like there are people who have come from very abusive backgrounds and manage to thrive in life. And then there are other people who come from similar backgrounds and really don't do much because of, you know, those memories that continue to clutter up their mental space. So do you think that every single person based on your experience needs to resolve their trauma or are there particular markers? Because there's so much that can challenge you in life. It's not always past memories. So how do you spot that? The reason that you're stuck in life, the reason that you're suffering is probably because of repressed memories or past life experiences. How how do you know that? Honestly, it's so, I think, existential. Some clients will come in and they'll already know. I'm not doing well in my relationship. I think it's because of what happened with my parents. Or some clients will kind of say, you know, my life is good, but I don't feel good. I feel depressed. Some people will kind of know or have an inkling that something is wrong that they need to work through. Other times, I would say it might be something that I bring up. Like if a client is telling me about their story, about their history, maybe they think it was okay or they think it was normal. But I might say, wow, everything that you're saying, you know, I wonder if you know that that's considered abusive. Were you aware of that? You know, so sometimes it's the therapist pointing out that something was off about their life or their history. So, you know, some individuals, I would say, are just very resilient and maybe they don't need to do this type of therapy. And I would say, you know, generally, if you've had an amazing life, 
wonderful and supportive parents that were constantly a supportive force in your life, then it might be easier to work through some of these things. But I would say if if maybe you didn't have that kind of support growing up or perhaps you were more isolated in your childhood, then I would say it might be harder to work through these challenges and that therapy could be incredibly beneficial. So I, you're right. Like it's every person is different. Every person's life circumstance is different. So there's no right or wrong answer for that. I always wonder if there is such a thing as a general sense of safety in life. Like there are people who just throughout life respond better if they look at the world and have positive beliefs and a general sense of well-being and safety as in the world is not rigged against me versus someone who believes that, you know, the odds are always against me. I'm if that's something, you know, people should look out for in their own behavior, in their own understanding and perception of the world. I think that's a great point. You know, we have to understand the way that we look at the world. We have to understand the way that we look at our lives and our relationships. Again, if we generally see the world as a great place and, you know, are positive, maybe more on the positive spectrum, maybe on the happier end of the spectrum, when adversity comes in, it is likely generally easier for that individual to work through versus if an individual feels like the world, like you said, is against me or, um, you know, I'm not happy, things are going poorly. When adversity comes, it will be just as hard to work through it. And it might actually even reinforce the belief that the world sucks and my life sucks. So it is so important to be aware of the way that we think. Anything you would recommend that people can do independently to spot that? You can for sure, like, slow down a little bit and notice the thoughts that you feel, notice how maybe you respond to situations, notice um, the circle of people around you and how you feel about them, what they think about you, right? Like you can kind of do like a self analysis and look at some of these different areas of your life. But I do think slowing down to take a pause and notice the way that you think can be very powerful. Yeah, that makes sense. There's something else that fascinated me, you know, as I was reading uh, about you on your website. Um, there is a combination of things that you help people with. There is trauma healing, anxiety, depression recovery, and overcoming addiction. I know you are, you know, you're a mental health expert, but let me ask you this. Are there any contributing factors that cause these problems, any commonality to these issues in life that that bring them together and, and make it so that you can do treatment that applies to all of them? Because it, it it's fascinating that, you know, overcoming addiction, anxiety, depression, and trauma healing could potentially go together. Yeah. You know, the, the th I don't know if this is answering your question, but the first thing that came to my mind when you were asking about commonality is that a lot of the individuals that walk through my door are unfortunately so isolated. Um, they don't have necessarily the support that they're wanting and that they're needing, and they're afraid to ask for support because the people in their lives currently are maybe not the best support in their lives. So I think part like the commonality is that there's um, a lot of isolating feelings that are happening. And so aside from just the therapeutic process, you know, one of the biggest goals that I work on with the people that come in is how can we increase and support a healthier support system for them to not be as isolated, to have community in life. Um, it, it's a it's a challenging feat, but that is one of the things that I think is so important in terms of the recovery component that's not even part of the, the therapy per se practice. It's something that the client works on outside of the therapy. Okay. On a scale of one to 10, I've always wanted to ask this question, where would you rate social connectivity? Where would you rate having healthy relationships as in, you know, when it comes to cultivating a healthier mental setup, mental well-being? 
How important are social connections to that? Oh my gosh, it's a 10 out of 10. Um, wow. Because, because look at our, if we look at our biology, human beings, we thrive when we have support. We thrive in community. Some of the, I think, worst kind of cases I've seen is when clients were neglected or clients were stripped of their support system. That's why cases like, um, you know, being in an orphanage or things like that, um, neglect, we see more post-traumatic stress that happens. So having support is like a 10 out of 10 necessity because human beings, our survival requires us to have support and community in our lives. And for a solitary person, and I, I am asking you this because I'm a very, very solitary person. I've spent most of my life trying to get away from people. <laughs> and I'm very independent, very solitary. So for people like that who are who love their own company, how are they supposed to look at social connections, the importance of social connections, cultivating it? I've had so many kind of, because of the work that I do, I have so many such conversations. And I understand that even as solitary as I am, I must try to at least a certain degree to cultivate a you know strong support system. And I've, I've got one and it does help me immensely. So I, I absolutely agree with you. I'm not disputing it. But for someone who is like me and who doesn't do this work, how would you want them to understand and look at the whole, this need of social connections that yes, you enjoy your company. Yes, you're very independent and you're, you're doing emotionally doing well. How are they then supposed to look at the criticality of social connections? You just said it's 10 on 10 and I'm guessing it's 10 on 10 for everyone. Well, yeah, everybody falls on a different spectrum of it. Some people, like you said, are highly independent. On the other end of that spectrum, there's codependency. Codependency is totally something that needs to be worked through also. And then there's that happy medium of interdependence where you can enjoy your own company, but also enjoy and appreciate the company of others and see the benefits of that. I really think like if you're somebody that's super independent, maybe do a little experiment with yourself. Um, Take a week where, let's say you you just hang out on your own. You don't really hang out with others. Notice what's what that's like for your mental health. Are you feeling isolated? Are you feeling anxious? Are you feeling depressed? Are you feeling sadness? Um, do you miss people? Right? Like, I think sometimes maybe doing a little experiment with yourself can be helpful because that might give a little bit of indication that. Maybe a week without seeing other people um, would be a bit on the extreme end. But if if a day or two is like your sweet spot, you enjoy spending that time one on one on your own. And then after two days, it's okay. Now you realize, okay, it's time that I step out. I see my circle of friends. I see my family. I, I'll feel better once I do that. Um, that can be really helpful too, to make sure that you know what your limits are. Everybody has their own limitations. That is an interesting idea. And I would recommend that to anyone who is like me. I always say that if I, I am the one person who can survive solitary confinement, <laughs> but, but I wonder how, how true that actually is. Because when you are with people who, who really get it right, as in, you know, people who really understand you, it's amazing. As much as I like my own company and I like solitude, that is re, you know, invigorating, that is rejuvenating. It's, it's, yeah. So I, I see your point there. Now, when, is there a possibility where you can, a scenario where you have completely resolved all of your trauma? I think. The reason I love my solitude so much has a lot to do with my childhood, has a lot to do with um, how I felt I was treated at certain points in my life. So I became an adult who's very independent, loves her own company. And I think that's true for most of us. Do we ever, is there a possibility that through therapy, through working with people like yourself, we can reach a point in our life where we are so healthy that the past traumas or past difficult experiences stop impacting our choices, especially emotional ones? Yeah, I do think, and again, it depends. It depends on if you have a good support system. It depends on, you know, if you're working, like 
how healthy and loving is your job? How healthy and loving is your relationship? If majority of those areas of your life are stable and healthy and positive, and you work through, you know, a lot of the traumatic events that have occurred in life, absolutely, you can get to a place where maybe you don't need therapy, maybe you can take a break from therapy, and you just live your life. Every now and then, sometimes clients like this will come back and just do like a random check in just for like a little tune up, but they don't need the weekly consistent support. That is totally possible. What I will say the caveat is there isn't an end to growth. This is what I've learned not only as a therapist, but in my own personal experience. The deeper and deeper I go, the more and more layers. I find that is important for me to work through and is important for me to explore. So I do think it depends how deep you want to go in your personal growth process and how deep you want to look at your life, your past, um, things like that. So I'm kind of a firm believer that personal growth is sort of a never ending process, but that doesn't mean you have to be in therapy forever. You can pause, you can personally grow in other ways outside of therapy. It doesn't have to be therapy for the next 50 years or anything. Okay. That is interesting. I want to go deeper into that. But first, let me ask you, cultivating endurance versus healing. So everything that you've described up to this point, it sounds amazingly supportive and it is very healing focused. And then there are people who think, fuck all of this everything that has happened to me up to this point, I am just going to shove it aside. I'm going to decide what I want out of my life. I'm in control. I'm going to do it. Um, So endurance versus healing in that context. And secondly, the same question in a context where people, you see what is happening in today's world. We are very frequently talking about the fragility of the the younger generation and a decline in resilience that there is. I don't know if you agree with that or not. Uh, so let me know about that as well. Um, so there is that and that that's endurance in that context where we are talking about resilience. How healing focus does someone have to be? And what amount of mental space should you give to cultivating endurance? So those two contexts, if you can help me understand those. And I'm happy to repeat the question if you need me to. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think I understand what you're asking me. So Resilience. Resilience is our ability to keep working through, keep tackling, keep navigating as, let's say, challenging experiences come our way. Resilience is a good thing because I share this with everybody. Let's say you you do your trauma work in, in therapy and you feel good and you feel done with the therapy. I cannot guarantee that another traumatic event won't happen to you. And that's just the unfortunate reality because we do not live in a perfect world. We do not live in a world where things are always just, right? So I cannot guarantee that your life is going to be easy from here on out. So where the resiliency comes in is you feeling confident in your ability to navigate it, to work through the other things that might come your way through some of the tools that let's say you did learn in therapy or some of the insights that you did learn in therapy. That's resiliency. When you talk about endurance, I kind of look at that differently when the way that you described it, and we can, we can have a dialogue here on this, but when you say putting everything in a box, shoving it to the side and then moving forward, I don't know if I want to call that endurance. I I call that compartmentalization. And what compartmentalization is, is exactly that. You put everything in a box and then you don't really deal with it. That works in the short term. That doesn't work in the long term, in my experience, my professional opinion. The reason being is when we compartmentalize, it's really helpful in the here and now for our survival. Like I'm going to use COVID, the pandemic as an example. I think a lot of us compartmentalized at the time because we were just trying to survive that time. We were trying to survive the shutdowns. We were trying to survive the unknowns. We didn't know what was exactly going on in the beginning. Right. But now a couple of years later, 
some people are still dealing with the aftermath of it and they can no longer compartmentalize because we're not in that survival place anymore. So there is purpose to compartmentalization. I'm not saying that it's wrong or bad to do, but it will catch up to you later on. And it's important not to ignore it. It's, it's important to allow some things to come out of that box so that you can work through it. Otherwise, it will manifest in so many different ways. So they both have purpose. We need to develop resiliency. It's important to also notice when we do compartmentalize. Um, and as a therapist, you know, I have to compartmentalize in order to do my job. If I take every person's story home with me into my personal life, I'm not going to survive either. That's not going to work. So there is a place for compartmentalization, but we, we need to know what our limits are with that. We need to know also what are the areas of life we do need to kind of pull out from that box to work through. I hope that answered the question. Absolutely, absolutely. And that was amazing because I think that is very healthy perspective. <laughs> I, you know, see a lot of the the conversations that happen around mental health happen in a very in itself, it's triggering. So I appreciate um, the manner with which you answer that question and, and how you sort of, like, you know, you are, obviously I'm sensing you're brilliant at this, taking you to a calmer, more relaxed place and helping people get that perspective, right? Where you are saying, yes, resilience is important. Of course, it's important for you to thrive through life. You what anything can come up in life and for you to get through it and not fall apart you need resiliency but at the same time and when you are in survival mode you're going to compartmentalize you're going to keep your shit together and keep moving forward but you also need to heal eventually you need to stop and look at everything that you've shoved in that box and bring it out so that it doesn't yes. trip you up later in life yes. you know yeah, it's like, you know, the soldiers are the strongest elements of humanity. Like, they're the strongest people. And yet, we're always telling them PTSD, so, uh, like dealing with your post-traumatic stress is so, so incredibly important. So I think remembering that, it could be yes, possibly helpful. Yes, definitely. Okay, that, that, that's, that's amazing. That's really helpful. We see so much conversation happening around excessive reliance on therapy, excessive reliance on constantly bringing out trauma and it getting into the in the way of healthy um, living. But this is your area of expertise. This is how you've helped so many people thrive in life, build good lives. So talk to me about that. What mindset would you recommend people bring to therapy? And is there such a thing as excessive reliance on therapy? Well, I'm very much kind of a, a realist type of person. Um, so I am very honest with people when they come into to sessions with me. A client might share their story. They might say, um, this, this, and this occurred. This is how it's affecting me now. And I want to work through it and, and tell me how many sessions you know I need. And I tell people, I wish I could tell you how many sessions you might need, but there is absolutely no way for me to do that because A, every person is different. Every person works works through their stuff differently. Every person's brain is different and processes things differently. And I also, you know, tell people, and it also depends on, like we were talking about earlier, your level of support, your support system in life, because that will impact your development and your growth. So I think the mentality that that clients can come in with that would help them set them up for success is to allow the process to be what it is and to do your best to be patient with yourself. Because if you expect to work through, you know, your childhood issues in three sessions, I don't think that's necessarily realistic. And I think that would set somebody up for failure. Versus if you just gave yourself time, if you gave yourself space, and if you allow the process to unfold in the way that it needs to unfold, that would be better at setting up for success. Now, I realize that that's a little bit of a luxury. I realize that every, you know, therapy is expensive. So some people might not have that luxury. I also realize that some people want to use their insurance and insurance might have limitations. 
on the number of sessions, but if there is a way to do your best to just allow for the process to unfold the way it needs to unfold, that would help, you know, keep you successful in your therapy. So that's the mentality. I think the other thing too, is to not expect it to be easy. It might be hard, um, you know, in certain sessions, it might not be fun. I, I don't think therapy is always, or I guess the general feeling is that therapy is not fun, but you go because it's important and it's valuable to your development and to your support. So it, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be fun. So how can you have resiliency there? So, you know, these are just some of the, the ways in terms of the mindset that you were talking about. And do you see people relying too much on therapy? Too much on therapy? You know, I haven't seen too much of that, but I will say if you if you feel like you don't want to go out on your own, you know, and you're, let's say you're doing well, you've met all your goals, life is good, and you're not ready to taper down your therapy or to take a pause on therapy, then I think there might be too a little bit too much dependency. So that might be something to look at with your therapist for sure. And any limitations and challenges that you would want to share with your audience associated with therapy that, you know, there is so much that therapy can do, but it can only go so far or any other limitation challenges of therapy that you see get in the way of uh, you helping your clients? Yeah, well, the, the limitation really is, is that it's just the hour a week. You know, I only see typically see my people an hour a week and not more than that. And that in and of itself, I wouldn't call it a limitation per se, but I would say when I say that, I, what I mean is you also need to be doing the things that we're recommending and talking about outside of the therapy because I only see you an hour a week. So it's important to go out and get sunlight if you can to have your, you know, your meals throughout the day, take your medicine, drink lots of water to work on having community in your life. If those things are not happening outside of therapy, the therapy process will probably move a little bit slower. So I think that's a limitation in and of itself that I only see you an hour a week. Other limitations, I think, are more so related to the medical model, unfortunately. I know a lot of providers have difficulty with, you know, working with insurances. You know, insurances can be very challenging. And I know some clients can't afford to pay for therapy on their own. So I think some of those like real world limitations can get in the way. Um, I also think some of the laws... Um, can be a little bit outdated or need time to catch up with virtual being still a big predominant force. I know many therapists can only work with clients in the state where the client is located. And sometimes clients are traveling or maybe their work requires that they travel. So that can pose some challenges and some limitations. So I think some of it is just related to the, the medical model component. I have more questions about therapy. But before we do that, I also want to understand trauma better because I know that that is something you work with and you can really help my listeners with. Um, so we'll come back to therapy, but let me now go deeper into the trauma work that you do. First, I would love to understand how trauma changes your nervous system. Yeah. So when we think about trauma, traumatic events really rock our world because traumatic events, if you think about it, um, it's typically a situation where our physical safety was impacted, where our emotional safety was impacted or compromised, and it's incredibly distressing. Trauma is not necessarily the event that happened, but it's more so what we believe about ourselves, you know, after the event that happened. It's typically more so impacted by the aftermath of the incident. So when we talk about the nervous system, um, there's different ways to view our nervous system. So um, we all have what's kind of our healthy baseline, kind of our window of tolerance. When we get activated, however, we can kind of move, our nervous system moves to different places. 
we might be in a more what's called hyper aroused state where in hyper arousal, that's things like when our hearts are racing, when we move into fight or flight, um, you know, in terms of responding to trauma, um, the client might experience really, really heightened anxiety or heightened panic. That's kind of a hyper aroused state. And then there's something called hypo arousal. So some people go into um, what appears to be more like a depressive sort of place where their nervous system shut down, shuts down. There might be more of a fawn response. Um, and all of these coping strategies are, are kind of automatic. You know, it's not like we choose to go into hyper arousal or hypo arousal. And again, it's all about survival, dealing with trauma in the moment of it, in the aftermath of it is all about survival. So when we talk about nervous system response, hyper arousal, hypo arousal, it's all about survival as well. How are we going to survive in the moment? And it's our brain's way of doing our best to keep us safe. Is there a way for someone to understand and identify trauma for themselves? Like you, you know, you're very understanding about the fact that for some people, therapy is a luxury. So keeping that in mind, is there something people can do to on their own understand and identify their trauma? Would you even advise that it's something that people do? Yeah, look, not every bad experience is traumatic. Every traumatic experience is distressing, but not every distressing experience is traumatic. So I want to note that delineation here. I do think it is important for people just in general when they're ready to do kind of a self-assessment. So if let's say something really dangerous happened, you know, we would want to ask like, how did that impact you? How, how do you, how did you feel about it? How do you kind of remember that memory now? How does that memory now impact you? So that self-assessment is important. Again, when we're talking about that delineation, and this is something a little bit more nuanced, let's say, you know, as a child, my parents got divorced, as an example, that might not be traumatic to me, but maybe if I'm talking to a friend where in their childhood, their parents divorced, they might have found it to be traumatic because so many other things happened surrounding it. So sometimes doing a self-assessment can be very powerful. Also, though, if you go see a therapist, maybe certain things that you experienced, you didn't realize was a trauma until your therapist pointed it out. So there's really no right or wrong, but a self-assessment could be very powerful. I am guessing that if you've had traumatic experiences, they will impact, like, you know, we talked about your perception of the world, but they will also impact the story you have about yourself, the narrative we are building every single day of our lives and our self-perception as well, right? You said it perfectly. That's 100% accurate. So help my listeners understand how deep the impact goes, because I don't think very many of us, especially, you know, if you don't do this kind of work and, and if you don't interact with this kind of content, you sort of never, this never comes up where you understand the criticality of that personal narrative that we have and all the factors that sort of play into it. So look, trauma, trauma is deep and trauma is a mind fuck. Um, and let me, let me just give you an example. Um, of a lot of the, the clients that I work with. So part of the trauma work that I do is working with survivors of childhood sexual abuse, right? Um, oftentimes these clients know that what happened to them wasn't their fault. They know that it was wrong. Intellectually, they know these things. But for whatever reason, like you said, the story that many of these clients tell themselves is it was my fault. If only I did X, Y, and Z, I could have prevented it. Even though logically, that's not true. Logically, again, the brain did and the body did what it needed to do to survive, right? Um, I hope this, this content is not too triggering, but, but the other aspect of how it's a mindfuck is when we're talking about sexual abuse, sometimes sexual abuse 
while we know it was not a good thing that happened to the individual, the body may have felt pleasure in those moments. So the reason why I'm giving this example is because oftentimes people have such a hard time making sense of it. People have such a hard time dealing with the shame that they just bottle up and compartmentalize the shame that they feel. Um, Or clients have a hard time maybe now in their adult lives in romantic relationships, for example. So it does go very deep, these experiences, and it is hard to make sense of. So that's why, you know, that self-assessment is, is important. But at the same time, having that supportive space is, is very important. And, you know, that's just one example of trauma. There are other types of traumatic events that run so deep, but it is an incredibly deep experience to go through, to carry, to hold. And it is a mind fuck, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. And I can, you know, because of that example, you can see how it will change how you move through the world, how you treat yourself, how you treat others. You know, there's there are a lot of people, uh, experts, who believe that you should have no attachment to your story, change your story, however, you know, the situation demands it. But I wonder if that's even possible because your story is, well, it's your story. It's, it's shaping all of your choices. But is that even possible? Like we have labels that we attach to ourselves. We have this way of, I know that if I'm placed in X, Y situation, I can just take it on and move through it very quickly because I see myself as this person, as the strong, confident person who can tackle these things. But then when it comes to certain other areas, I'm going to slow down. I'm going to take my time with it because uh, it's just so those are my labels those are that's how i see myself and the same applies to everyone is it possible to not be attached to your personal narrative considering you know what you just pointed out how your trauma impacts it how every experience that you're accumulated accumulating throughout your life is impacting it is that is that healthy to do not attaching it too much to your personal narrative can it be done you know here's what i would say If it were that easy, we wouldn't have a need for therapists. We wouldn't have a need for psychiatrists. We wouldn't have a need for other types of healers, acupuncturists, Reiki specialists. If it were that easy, oh my gosh, people in the world would be so much more harmonious, right? I don't think we would have wars going on right now. So is it possible? I can't speak on that. In my personal experience, it hasn't been possible. I've needed a lot of therapy to work through things. In terms of the clients that I've seen, it it was not, that's not easy for them. So I I can't attest to that experience being easy. What I think would be a, a more helpful delineation is to look at it more from thoughts, right? So maybe we can work on not attaching ourselves to the thoughts that come in our brain, because we have so many thoughts that move through our brain. It's like a mile a minute, actually. And sometimes people feel challenged or feel distressed because they believe whatever thought comes to their brain, right? Yes. Um, This is very CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. So instead of kind of expecting yourself to not attach to your story, maybe start by just trying to not attach to thoughts. Not every thought is accurate or factual that comes in your mind. So really assess the validity of it. So that would be my feedback to that. But no, it's not easy at all to do that. That's an amazing, amazing insight. Thank you for that. And yeah, it as you were, you know, saying, um, saying what you were saying right now, it just it brought up this idea in my head that I would like to point out to my listeners. A lot of the time, we look at online personalities, we look at famous people who, you know, racked up achievements and done so much, and we look at them and we think, oh, this person came from this horrible background, had this amount of abuse or X Y thing happened to them, and yet, you know, they managed to thrive. At the same time. So many of these people, when you hear their story, you learn that they actually used what happened to them as fuel, you know, to keep going through the most difficult moments. So you are, those people are attaching very much to their story, very much to what has happened to them. They're not 
they're not actually pushing it aside. They're actually, in fact, using it. So we often look at these people and we feel kind of envious because they are able to thrive despite their backgrounds. But I wonder how much power they're actually drawing from that background. It's not despite the background, it's actually you using that background to not stay in that place and move to a better place and, and so thrive. But at the same time, also, just how healthy your general energy is, just how healthy your general self and world perception is. Well, certainly. I mean, there are certainly people that absolutely use their adversity to their advantage and try to make something of their lives, right? It's so funny. The, the more you were talking about it, I was thinking about a documentary that I watched a while ago on Arnold Schwarzenegger. I don't know if you saw it on Netflix. Um, but he talks about, you know, his early days as a bodybuilder. And he talks about his childhood in Austria and how his father was kind of abusive, you know, and he used that experience to try and make something of his life and uh you know become this like world champion famous bodybuilder and then obviously eventually go on as an actor however when i think about him and his documentary that doesn't mean that he didn't have a responsibility to himself to look at the areas of life that needed to be looked at like maybe that experience with his father in childhood because if you saw in his adult life, he went through other adversity in his adult life. His marriage didn't work out. He had an affair. Um, so sometimes our past does still catch up to us. Now, I don't know this man. I've never treated this man. So I, I will just put out the disclaimer. I have no idea if something from his experience with his dad or his childhood impacted his adult marriage, but I'm just kind of posing it as like a thought or as a question that just because you're using your adversity to achieve amazing things and achieve your goal doesn't mean that the past might not catch up to you. It, it very well might, and it might manifest in unhealthy ways in adult life. Yes, that is something I think about a lot. Thank you for pointing that out. I could not have put it as cleanly as you put it out because my thoughts are so chaotic around this. But I, you know, I often like anybody who listens to my show knows this. I am generally confident. I'm generally open to life. But I'm always wondering when I pull back, when I refuse to go too deep into some experience how much of that is being impacted by some past experience i mean no, you don't always have to be that analytical about everything i think that has something to do with the fact that i do this work but i am always wondering if how certain experiences are manifesting and making some choice and not living fully in that particular moment might have something to do with some fear deep down and i think it becomes difficult to acknowledge that to yourself when you generally see yourself as a confident, strong, tough person, and you've kind of made that your identity and you've made it so the world looks at you and sees someone very strong. It becomes very difficult to then slow down and even in a moment by yourself acknowledge that I'm vulnerable. I can't do this because I'm afraid. It becomes very difficult to say that. So yeah. yeah. No, definitely what you shared up to this point, it it compels thought and it, it you know invites people in a very safe way to think about this. Another thing that I find very interesting about your work is how much focus you give to cultural background and societal experiences impacting your mental health and your life experiences. Tell me to what extent that is true and to what extent these factors play into your mental well-being and how we can account for it and how a therapist can help you do that. Do that kind of work. So culture plays plays a big role, um, and we're all part of a culture, right? Like we could be part of our family culture, our family of origin. We can be part of the societal culture that we live in right now. A combination of both, um, and it, it does play a big role because if you think about it, we want to understand how our culture, what our culture believes about mental health. Is there a stigma around mental health? Is there, 
openness to talk about mental health. I can talk about my culture. I'm part Armenian and part Russian. And, you know, in the older generations of, of my parents and, you know, grandparents and so forth, this wasn't really talked about. You know, there wasn't really discussion about, are you mentally well? How's your well-being? You know, are you experiencing depression? How are you? What's going on? So when we kind of grow up in these cultures where mental health issues are stigmatized, it can have an impact on us. And it can have an impact on, like you said, our story about ourselves. It can impact if we seek help in the future. So culture does have an interplay. I think culture also has a big interplay on identity too. Like as a woman, for me, you know, I think about what my culture believes a woman is supposed to be and um, how that impacts me. So culture is, is important. And when we also talk about culture too, if we're tying it back to trauma, we also want to know, is there intergenerational trauma, you know, that has occurred in our culture, right? And again, speaking to, let's say, my Armenian side, um, there is oftentimes intergenerational trauma in the Armenian community because the Armenian community comes from, sadly, genocide history um, from many generations past. So we might not be aware of how the intergenerational stuff impacts us, but there is a lot of research on how intergenerational trauma in certain cultures even, you know, correspond to the DNA of us and our lives. So it's something that's very, and like I said, it's not something you necessarily have to look at in intergenerational trauma, but also, if you want to go deep, you know, it might be worth exploring what do you feel like your family and many ancestors ahead of you went through and how does that impact you today? You know, how does that impact you now in your life? It may not or it may very well impact you. Would that apply to someone like you know, use your example, if you are Armenian, but you grew up in America, and you grew up in that particular society, in that culture that, that America offers, would that, would your Armenian ancestry, would your Armenian background still have very, you know, a lot of relevance to your mental health? Yeah, I would say so. Because even though, you know, I'm an Armenian American, Armenian Russian American, and um, even though I was born in the United States. So I, I am a very Americanized Armenian Russian. I will say that to be clear. But when my country is suffering, when my people are suffering, being very honest, I, I feel the suffering. Even though I'm very blessed, I live in the United States, I'm, you know, safe and I'm not impacted by the political issues that are going on in the homeland, but I feel the pain. And that is because I come from that lineage. I come from that ancestry where my ancestors had to escape persecution and discrimination and all of that. So this is why, you know, we're unfortunately seeing a lot of turmoil in the world right now, because many of us do come from lineage where there was significant unrest, there was significant trauma and pain and political challenges and war. And even though, let's say now, you're, you're, let's say you're lucky and you're blessed and you live in a, in a safe place and you're not directly impacted, you are still indirectly impacted because it, it hurts to see this and to watch this stuff unfolding how can people use this knowledge to anyone listening who is you know feeling the sensitivity of what you've just brought up how do we use this knowledge practically to help ourselves yeah so knowledge is power knowledge is always going to be the first step in our growth and in our healing so we first want to 
gain some clarity and insight that this is impacting us because let's say we might come from a particular cultural or religious lineage where there was persecution happening and there might still be persecution happening. And what we want to do with it really depends. You know, some people are out there and they're being amazing and they're activists and they're trying to spread the word on how you can help and what you can do to support the, you know, underserved groups. Um, Some people are kind of taking a more approach of self-preservation. So maybe they're kind of keeping away from the coverage that is happening right now just to preserve their own mental being and mental health. Some people are starting to have more conversations with their families, which I think is amazing on tell me about your life. Tell me about what you know our family experienced. Um, and that can bring a lot of healing and support. So again, there's no right or wrong with this. It's just a matter of what feels right to you and what feels um, supportive and healing and and helpful to not only yourself and your lineage, but to the community overall. Yeah. And I'll um, point out this one thing that you said during our conversation was to slow down because I see a lot of people very action oriented and they're just, it's go, go, go with them, especially the activists. Like you said, they, they're getting things done. They're out there, they're helping people and it's beautiful to watch. But at the same time, you wonder how much of that energy is fueled by a lot of emotion that they're not actually dealing with. Not That's not necessarily true for all activists. They probably, you know, meet with their therapist on a regular basis. But at the same time, you really wonder, considering the, the sheer amount of work they're getting done. So, and, and yeah, especially during these past few months with what has been happening and all the protests that, ha- that have been happening and the people protesting, you see them, they are, they're young kids, young students, Ivy League students, some of them. So clearly have very busy schedules um, and you see so much anger. You see so much, no, and I'm not talking about one group or the other, all across everyone. So, so angry. Even people who are not directly involved, they they don't belong to either groups involved in the conflict, and yet they're so angry that they are they're resorting to violence, you know, and and that really makes me wonder, you know, what you've been talking about, the criticality of this conversation, and understanding how important this work, the work that you do, and how important it is to deal with all of these emotions and how it impacts you. Yeah, when there's violence. I... Look, I can't speak to every individual because I don't know what's happening with every individual. But when I when I look at violence, I I think about rage, and certainly, rage has its purpose. It means that the individual feels like there's something wrong going on, and maybe their rights or the rights of others have been violated. So there is a purpose to rage. But when rage goes unchecked, when rage sort of takes a hold of someone and turns into violence, that's really hard. And that's, that's something that I would encourage, you know, to look at because unfortunately violence perpetuates more trauma. It just keeps that cycle of trauma going and going and going. And, you know, my goal is so that people don't keep getting traumatized. I hate seeing that there's more and more trauma unfolding onto innocent people. So I I wish we lived in a world where everyone would check in on everything, their trauma histories, their ancestral lineage and, and what's impacting them, perhaps their rage. We don't live in a perfect world, like I said earlier. So, um, but if there's a way to really, like you said, slow down, pause and look at that, we might see things happening in a different way. Yeah. You know, not everybody's response is to get violent or even get loud and angry. I mean, pretty much everyone is pissed right now. You know, anytime you watch the news, you get angry, you get disappointed, you get disillusioned, and you really start to wonder what the hell is going on. And then there are action-oriented people who will, you know, protest, take to the streets. Uh, But not everybody responds 
violently. They wouldn't hit someone who is saying something that adds to the the provocation that is so very much present. They can see that this person holds views that are directly in opposition to their own views, and they might identify those views as really problematic, but they're still not going to get violent. I wouldn't get violent. You wouldn't get violent. Um, so there are anything, any personal qualities that make you more prone to violence, that make you more prone to responses, or is it always, could that ever be the case? Or is it always how you are treating your mental health and how much you're dealing with all of what is coming up within you? Well, everyone's reactions are different. You know, um, certainly if someone grows up in a household where violence was modeled, maybe there was, I'm not saying everyone from a vi- who has violent history becomes violent. However, it's possible that if somebody comes from a household where violence was modeled, then there maybe is kind of a normalization of it. And it might appear that that person may express themselves in a more violent manner when triggered. That certainly is a possibility. I talked about rage earlier. So if if rage isn't, I don't want to use the word controlled, but if rage isn't understood and worked through, rage may may turn into violence. Everyone has their own, you know, response, you know, when it comes to what they've witnessed and what they've experienced. Absolutely. Any personal qualities that you would recommend that people try and cultivate to cope better with what is going on? It depends on what feels like support to you. Some people are out there and they're engaging in activism and that feels incredibly positive and incredibly healthy and supportive. Others are focusing on um, that self-preservation piece, right? Like how can, how can you have boundaries with what's going on in the world? Maybe boundaries with social media so you're not inundated with all of the information that's coming out. Some people are doing a combination of both. Some people talking about it in therapy. I'm so glad people are talking about this in therapy because it's it's just so necessary to feel and experience this. Um, and, you know, everybody has their own, I guess, way to cope with what's going on. So I don't, like I said, I don't think there's a right or wrong. It's just a matter of exploring and slowing down and seeing what works for you. And do you see social media and the hyperconnectivity of the world getting in the way of a therapist's work? Social media, man, it's a mixed bag. I hate yeah. to say it. I'm on social media for business and for personal, and it's a mixed bag. Social media is amazing for connectivity and sharing resources and sharing information, but it's also too much information sometimes, or it's information that maybe we're not ready for or images that we are not wanting to see or ready for. So social media is definitely a challenge. I would say in general, though, when I've suggested like, let's take a social media break to myself, to my clients, to really anybody, the mental health typically improves. So there is, there's something to say about that. Can you share with me the experience of going through trauma therapy, working through trauma, what that feels like, what trauma recovery feels like? Well, the initial stages of of the trauma work is to just First, get yourself in the therapy room, get yourself in the door and get to working with your therapist to hopefully start feeling comfortable with your therapist. Um, That is definitely the first step. The next step is just understanding how these memories are impacting you. So as another example, are these memories impacting your relationships now? Is it affecting your job? So really understanding how your life today is being impacted, not only how your life in the past was impacted. And then it's about really working through 
your symptoms. What are the symptoms that are coming up for you and working on stabilization of those symptoms? And then from there, really working with that modality. So it can be EMDR, it can be brain spotting, it can be other somatic interventions that are present and available. And from there, I I used this earlier in the podcast today, but what healing feels like is it literally feels like a weight has been lifted off of you. It feels like, wow, I can think about the past today. I can think about the memory today and not feel like it was my fault or not feel like I did anything wrong or not feel like the world is unsafe. It's like literally that weight is lifted and you see the situation for what it was and not through the shame oriented lens that you might've had before. Um, And you just feel more neutral. Neutrality is such a beautiful thing when it comes to trauma work. You made trauma recovery sound like something I hope from the bottom of my heart people can get, like they can go through this process in a safe environment with a therapist. But a lot of experts say that when you do it independently, when you do it on your own, you're opening a Pandora's box. And if you're not equipped to deal with it, it could take you to some very dark places and you wouldn't know how to make your way back. Is that true? Because I also see a lot of people who are just, who catastrophize, you know, to gain viewers. How much would you agree with that? Yeah. So it depends on where you're kind of at in life. So again, if you don't have a lot of support in your life, if you feel isolated, if you're, um, not doing well in life, then I would say it's best not to open that box un- until you have a good working relationship with a trauma therapist. If generally, like you're very resilient, if generally you have had a good childhood with good family, a good support system, now your life is stable, and maybe something happened where you just want to work through it then it might be easier to open up that box on your own. However, I would still say it would be best to work with a professional so that you're not alone in dealing with it and working with it in a way that's appropriate. Any uh, story, any client experience that has particularly moved you, a story of transformation, and you don't have to share any specifics, but that, that would just bring home to my listeners just how deep the transformation can go. Yeah, I mean, I really love everybody that I work with. So it's hard to to kind of pick somebody. Um, but I, I used to, I don't anymore, I mainly work with adults now, but early in my career, when I was working towards my license, I used to work with kiddos, um, children and adolescents with trauma history. And I just remembered like the way that their face would change when they had an outlet to share their story, to rework their story, to even draw their story and have somebody sit across from them and say, I believe you, your story matters. You're so courageous. You're so beautiful and resilient to just see how their face would change and their face would light up was just so magical and so powerful to me. And, and truly, like even now when I work with adults after every EMDR session, when a client says to me, oh, I feel tired, but I feel so much lighter now, that makes me feel so positive and happy because I'm like, okay, I know we're not done, but the fact that you can go home and feel lighter just feels amazing. So yeah, it's really cool. That helps. Um, okay, we're reaching the end of our time. So let me ask you quickly uh, for your wellness practices. How are you living your life or any deliberate intentional practices that you have that help you deal appropriately with your experiences, continue to maintain a me- healthy mental space? Yeah. So I don't do anything mind blowing. Honestly, I feel <laughs> like I do the things that we all read online that are good. I get my eight to nine hours of sleep. Sleep is so important to mental health. I see a therapist twice a month to work through, continue to work through my own stuff. Um, I work out 
four times a week, working out and movement is really good for my mental health. I highly recommend to do some sort of movement in life if you can. I have a really special and loving dog that I play with. So, you know, I have joy in that way. I try to eat healthy and I, I I need to still work on this because sometimes working in private practice can be a little bit lonely, but I try to have a good community of colleagues, a good community of friendships um, that I talk with on a regular basis so that I'm not maybe feeling as isolated as previously. So yeah, I feel like I'm not doing anything mind bottling. I feel like I'm doing the basics that I think we all could benefit from. Finally, just I want to know from you how people can work with you, any piece of content that where you would want to direct your attention or any product or any workshops or anything that you've got coming up that listeners should know about. Yeah. So like I said, I'm based in Los Angeles, California. Um, so if you are looking to work with someone in LA, you can go to my website at roadtowellness.co, R-O-A-D, the number two, wellness.co. You can also find me on Instagram and TikTok at Therapy with Janet B. I try to post a bunch of content on my page uh, related to mental health and wellness. Um, And you can ask me questions on there, which is great. So those are some of the areas where you can find me. Um, I also have several therapists working in my practice. So if I'm not available, I've highly trained and vetted. My therapists, they're amazing. So you can also work with some of the therapists on my team too. We talked about the cultural impact. If someone is seeking therapy, especially, you know, trauma-related, trauma recovery, um, help around that, can they work with someone who belongs to a different culture? How helpful would that be? You can. You can. Some people specifically want to work somewhat with, with someone outside of their culture because that just feels more comfortable. I will say I generally get a lot of people that are Armenian. People can tell I'm Armenian by my last name. And they say, I want to work with you because you understand my culture. So the cultural piece is very powerful. They Oftentimes people want to work with someone of the same background or someone that looks like them to feel that connection. So we've reached the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching and for sharing your time with me. The video description will have the link to all the resources mentioned during the conversation. And if you would rather listen to these episodes, then you can find Experimental Podcast on most podcast platforms. If you enjoyed the video, please do share your thoughts in the comment section. And if you want to watch more, subscribe to the channel, please, and do hit the notification bell. I will see you again in the next video. Until then, please do take care of yourself. Bye.